Hello and welcome. If you are interested in securities lending, repo, collateral management, then this is the place for you. Now, because we're not limited to traditional assets today, we're bringing you another session on digital assets, the perception of money, and the issues thrown out by digital currencies. So welcome to another episode of Securities Lending Live with PeerPoint. Uh, we've been away for a little while. Our last show actually was on uh, cryptocurrencies as well. So that seems to be uh, the 2021 second half trend for the team at PeerPoint. So we're back today. Next week, we're going to have our second annual Christmas quiz with the PeerPoint team and close friends. Uh, then in the new year, we're going to go back to the regular Wednesday live streams, except we're going to do it every two weeks rather than on a weekly basis. So today we're coming to you live on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and for the first time, we're on Twitter as well. Who knows how that'll work out? But uh, but look, live streaming is all about the adventure. Uh, the objective of these events, of course, is to talk about uh, relevant and topical issues and themes. But mostly we do these live so that you can ask questions and make comments and share your own views. We don't purport to be the experts on, on everything. Uh, our guests are experts on the things we invite them in to join us to talk about. But this is about forming opinions and views. So although this is live, it'll also be available for replay. So if you miss a live event, you can always catch us on our YouTube channel. So we'll just uh, flip that up somewhere here as soon as I can find it. Roy, sorry to interrupt. Could you just jiggle your uh, sound? It went a bit mute. Okay. So That's better. Uh, better? Yep. Okay. Well, again, live streaming is an adventure. So if I didn't have sound problems from time to time, you'd all be disappointed with that. Um, right. So, uh, practically because I'm also host and producer, you see my eyes darting all over the place. That's to make certain I'm keeping the show running. Uh, don't forget there's a delay between you putting comments into your platform and me being able to see you. If you're doing it on LinkedIn, uh, please also include your name. Cause I can't always see, uh, see who the person is that's actually asking the question. Um, and that's it. So John and I, look, we're really excited about today's uh, topic and our guest. As I said, our last live stream was on crypto assets. And that's what we're talking about again today. Now, I've been trying to get today's guest on this session for months, <laughs> but it's been impossible to organize our schedule. So we've got him today. I pinned him down last week. Uh, and so now I'm just going to ask uh, the, uh, the my uh, panelists and guests to introduce themselves. So Paul, please introduce yourself now. Roy, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Roy and John, thank you very much for inviting me onto the uh, live stream. Um, I'm Paul Amory. I'm the editor of a publication called New Money Review, uh, newmoneyreview.com. Uh, I've been a journalist for 13 years uh, covering different aspects of finance. I started off writing a lot about ETFs and financial indices. Uh, wrote a fair amount on market infrastructure in kind of broad terms. And uh, I started New Money Review to look at what I, I saw as the, the changes going on in money, partly inspired by the arrival of cryptocurrency, which I found a fascinating development, but also looking more broadly at what's going on uh, across the uh, financial system. And I, I have to say, it's, uh, you know, when I took it, took this topic on, I thought it was going to be a, you know, a big one and difficult to define. But if anything, it's uh, it's kind of bigger than I ever anticipated. So it's a it's a great it's a great topic to be covering. Uh, I, I try to focus on a few key, on the website. I try to focus on a few key themes of interest, uh, whether that's from within cryptocurrency or payments or evolution of stores of value. And um, I should also mention that I, I have a background in asset management and trading. I started as a graduate trainee at Schroders in 1987, a couple of weeks before the uh, 1987 crash, if, uh, if your attendees remember that. Um, and I then worked as a, as a fixed income fund manager for a few years at Schroders. I had a couple of trading jobs um, in the late 1990s in emerging market debt. And, uh, and then after another stint back in asset management, I switched to journalism and I've been making my living doing this ever since. Uh, thanks very much, Paul. So you've gone from emerging market debt well, first of all, I think many of the viewers might have heard about the crash in 87. I'm not certain that everyone remembers it. I'd actually just moved over to the UK just in time to launch a new business 
which was decimated by the uh, by the crash. So you move from emerging market debt into ETFs, and now you're into digital assets. I got to tell you, you are a trend follower. <laughs> All right, thanks for that, Paul. We'll be back to you in a minute, John. Uh, over I mean, to how can I follow that? Um, it's pretty <laughs> pretty extensive pedigree there, Paul. Um, so I'm John Anderson. I'm the lead consultancy. I'm the lead consultant for uh, Pierpont Financial. Um, I've spent 30 years in the securities financing industry, um, working, leading um, various agency lending businesses for a number of institutions over the years. Okay, that's great. Thanks, thanks very much, John and Paul. So, uh, I just want to say a couple of quick hellos. So, Fanny, uh, always appreciate you uh, spending time with us and uh, and watching. Um, looking forward to any comments or questions that you have. And Amel, uh, also great to see you. You are my most active questioner on on YouTube. So, uh, ship in your questions today. So, um, no New Zealand today, then, Roy. Uh, not yet. It's still early. That's it's true. still early. We're still late there. You know whatever i think i think lockdowns might have been great for our viewing uh over the past year and so we'll see what it's like in a less lockdown environment now um look, I, what i want to do um is maybe paul maybe you can start us with um a, really the, the the context you kind of alluded to it and what what you were talking about with the the whole idea of of store of value and money and all that maybe can you just Give us some some perspective here in terms of uh, of of our perception of money, our thinking, how it's evolved, and where we are today. Yeah, sure. Right. Well, where to start? Um, maybe let, let's start by looking looking at it. I mean, there are, there are many uh, answers to that question, and maybe we can explore some of them uh, during the next uh, fifty minutes. But let's maybe start with the historical context, because um, I think a lot of people I've been, whose thoughts I've been reading over the last few years are suggesting that this is really the, we're at a kind of watershed now between the Bretton Woods era that started in 1944 with the Bretton Woods Conference at which the IMF and the World Bank were set up and the post-World War II monetary regime was set up um, and the dollar was, became the, the global reserve currency. Uh, and a lot of people are saying that that is now that period is now coming to an end and we're, <clears throat> we're moving into a, a new era. And what, what is coming, no one's quite sure, but it seems to be a, um, a recurrent theme. Mark Carney said this, I think, three years ago. Uh, David Birch, whose book, the, the Currency Cold War, I can really recommend as, a, as an overview of the kind of geopolitics of money. He's saying the same thing. You know, so what is coming next? And, and, and we've seen with, uh, with Bitcoin and the emergence of cryptocurrency, the idea that a new store of value, I mean, it may be a store of value loosely termed because Bitcoin and crypto is incredibly volatile, but it's certainly kept value for the people who were involved early on. You know, the idea that there's something like that can kind of come out of nowhere and uh, challenge the existing monetary system is a very, is clearly a very interesting and disruptive idea. So, um, so we're in a, I think we're in a period of great flux. I don't think we necessarily, I don't think it's easy to, 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 you know, to work out or to, to gauge how disruptive, you know, where we are in the in the in the period of, of change, I think it's this is going to be probably uh, a theme for the for the next uh, decade or two. Uh, it'll probably occupy me for the rest of my uh, working life. So, I, I, you know, I think we're in a we're in a we're in a period of great change, and I think we should um, we should try and uh, you know be aware of that and keep our eyes and ears open to what's going on around us, and maybe look outside the. You know, the traditional world of money, just as cryptocurrencies come from a, a world of you know young people involved in gaming and it's suddenly exploded into into fashion. You know, there there may be things going on outside the traditional infrastructure as much of money as we see it, whether it's you know, central banks or or the you know the securities settlement and clearing systems that you're so familiar with, you two. Uh, so that, I mean that's a, that's an opening thought. I'd be interested to hear your uh, your your ideas on that. Yeah, thanks. Ed. I mean, John, uh, I'm wondering if I can uh, just sort of turn to you maybe and because you've been tracking quite a lot of the activity with uh, the central bank digital currencies and the different paces that they've been going at, because that's really if, if we look at anything that's disruptive to uh, traditional assets, including traditional currencies, 
the reality is the central banks really are at the core of it. They can do things that could stop development or they can do things that enhance development or they can do things that replace the development. So so from from the things that you've been reading and studying, any any sort of observations there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, I think the fact that almost universally every central bank has plans or at least is in the project stage of looking at a digital currency or a central bank digital currency, it, it is testament to the fact that this thing is useful, that in fact a cryptocurrency, whatever it, whatever form it takes, has some utility. Um, but of course the divergence comes where we're talking about the likes of Bitcoin and its, and its neighbors and a central bank digital currency, which is completely different. Because the, the first really challenges the whole concept of a, of a fiat currency Although, and I'll ask Paul this in a minute, um, I don't know whether cryptocurrency is a very good descriptor of what it actually is, because one of the challenges I have to, that I still can't get my head around is we call this cryptocurrency, but is it really money? Because if I was transacting in Bitcoin over the last month, it'd be a nightmare because of its volatility. Now, you could argue that volatility is, is, an, is naturally inherent in something that is relatively new. And over time, of course, it still produces value and it keeps on, you know, it dips and then it rises uh, exponentially. So um, I think we'll see the first central bank digital currency having some application um, within the next two years. But I think they're developed as a counter to all of this because I don't think any government or central bank wants to see wholesale use of cryptocurrencies. For reasons they haven't really got their heads around yet. I mean, even the SEC is is now trying to grasp. You know, do I do I have to um, do I regulate this or not, or is it somebody else's job? And I think what's happening is that the governments are catching up to what is this? How can it be utilized? And and is it a threat? And so, Paul, one of my questions is: Is it right to call them money, or are they something else? Um, I, I think well, my answer to that would be that when I set up. I'm going to give an example from my publication, New Money Review. When I set it up, I thought, what's the best way to organize the content on the site? How do I present articles? What am I talking about? And I, I decided to organize the content sections according to the classical textbook definitions of money. So store of value, unit of account, uh, medium of exchange. I've kept payments as a separate uh, topic section because it's such a big area. So that's, that's four sections. So I think in terms of whether something is or is not money, we have to measure it against each one of those three or four um descriptions of money or attributes of money and the and the reality is that nothing works perfectly in, you know in all, all three areas so you know bitcoin is clearly not a not a payments medium it's not a great store of value although it's been going up a lot uh, uh, over the last few years it's very volatile as you pointed out um it's certainly not a unit of account but it has some attributes of money you know it's 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 uh it's fungible more or less fungible like gold you know you can transfer it very easily around the world so you know, has has some money uh, attributes. Uh, so, I think we should try and avoid. If you look, if you look back at some of the central bankers' criticisms of Bitcoin, you go back to some of the things that the Bank for International Settlements was saying a few years ago. You know, they say, well, they 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 criticize it and say Bitcoin. For, they criticize Bitcoin and say, you know, this is not a store of value. This is not a medium of exchange. Well, they're they're, they're right, but at the same time, if people are using it as money. Um, then who's to say it's not money? Well, you know, we, our, our definition of what money is and what can serve of money should be really broad because in the past people have used all kinds of things as money from, you know, from different commodities to company tokens you know, to different forms of IOU. You know, there's that famous uh, case of the, uh, the Pacific Island where, where people, uh, people's money were these you know, huge stones, these yap stones, which actually you, know, you couldn't pick them up and move them. You couldn't uh, you, you, you couldn't circulate them, but they were there standing on the ground and people used them as a way of recording ownership rights. And, and that, that clearly was a very valid form of money for that, that community, which was a few, you know, a few hundred people. So we need to think, I think, very uh, openly about what money is and what, uh, what can serve of, uh, as money. Uh, yes, I'd like, to pick, I'd like to pick up on one other thing you said, John, about um, terminology. I find this a really difficult area as well. I think cryptocurrency is not a great... Uh, term because currency is is you know, ref, refers to you know, liquid money yeah. um i have a problem with the term digital asset because if i think if we think about what digital asset means it just means a an asset whose ownership is recorded digitally well that's true of every 
the securities market in the world. It's only and in the 1960s. Yeah, so the 60s and 70s, you had maybe paper euro bond certificates and, and paper sh share certificates. But those went out from, I don't know, you, you guys know better than me. But, so, um, that's, but those are digital assets as well. So what are we talking about here? Well, we're, the reality is we people use digital assets to refer to this kind of new form of um, electronic money, but it's not really a very helpful definition. And we can easily go astray, uh, especially, you know, the, with loose, if you start with loose terminology, then the, as we know, the marketing and salespeople can have a field day and, and you know, represent things in, in a different way to the to what they actually are. So, yeah. So I can tell you when assets started going into digital <laughs> because I was actually at the depository then when we went from physically certificated to book entry yeah. uh, movement. So that was, at that time, it was just about immobilization rather than dematerialization. R yeah. rather than getting rid of all the certificates what we did was we piled them all into one place so it, it was it was a big transition and and obviously fundamentally changed the way the markets worked um the 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 interesting thing for me about digital assets is it's kind of if i look at the challenges of of timing and movement and recording and all of the issues that you get with you know even even assets that are recorded in depository ledgers there are still challenges there. And yeah. to me, one of the one of the goals and objectives of probably every custodian and every every dealer right now is trying to make this kind of digital transformation in terms of trying to find that next layer of efficiency. And so I, I think one of the interesting sort of impacts in the securities industry will be, you know, can any of these digital upstarts uh, replace custodians? Can custodians transform their own businesses? And, or are they going to acquire? My own view is I think they acquire firms, right? They wait for the, the, the new tech firms to actually create an infrastructure that can deal with the, the broadest range of digital assets, import that in through acquisition, and then transform their assets. But, but I don't know. I don't know if you have any thoughts Roy, on that. Isn't it fair to say, though, I mean, to Paul's point and ours, We've been we've been using digital assets since we can remember. I mean, everything's been materialized for the last 30 plus years. I think when we talk about digital assets, we mean employing the blockchain as a means of trans transferable assets. And is that the distinction we ought to make about one when the market talks about digitization, it talks about the use of blockchain chain technology as a differentiator to what we do now. So you mean in terms of applying things like a common domain model, smart contracts, just actually yeah, yeah. improving the infrastructure exactly, because, in because the analog world before we get to a fully, you know, blockchain world. Is that what you mean? Yes, because I think that distinction needs to be made. If you settle a transaction at Euroclear or Clearstream, you've been that's a digital transformation of the asset. But it isn't going, but it, the technology that could be applied to do that in future. I mean, you read last week that was it AXA and SOCGEN? have just completed a, a transaction across, no, it was, it was an issuance. So digital issuance using blockchain. And that makes it a different asset class than the ones we're normally traditionally talking about. I wonder if yeah. that's a fair, a fair comparison. Paul, I, I'm interested, have you been, because much of what we see with announcements like that, these are all kind of proof of concept movements. Yeah. And, and what we see is we see these one-off transactions. And my question always is, Great, you've proven it, but like, so what? Unless it becomes scalable, adaptable, you know, and and open to all, is it really? Does it make any difference? Well, I, I think maybe a, a good way to look at that is to is to talk about how settlement actually happens. So, uh, in, in the world of shares and bonds, um, if you if you do a share trade, for example, it settles in the usually in a, in a central securities depository that's. Uh, you know, maybe national or maybe a transnational, but that, but then at, at some point it settles in a the custodian bank. I mean, correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but at some point the custodian bank will settle the transaction in its accounts at the at the central bank. So there's a point in time at which that transaction is considered settled and, and final. That, I mean, that's a fundamentally different thing to what happens in Bitcoin and similar cryptocurrencies, uh, including Ethereum, which is still based on a a similar algorithm and in bitcoin trans uh, there's no moment of settlement it's just a it's just a probabilistic thing that you know people accept that over time it's going to be effectively impossible to reverse a transaction but you know there are just market conventions that uh, six blocks of bitcoin transactions so about an hour's worth of 
transactions mean that your settlement is effectively final and irreversible. Um, so that's a, that's a, that's a, that's quite a different that's a, quite a different way of looking at uh, settlement. And so a lot of the the digital asset um, uh, experiments have been you know the ones conducted by banks have tended to um, you know at the beginning of the cryptocurrency explosion you know people were saying well we you know we there was a phrase a few years ago where people were saying you know we we want blockchain not bitcoin we we like the idea of cryptocurrency we don't want the, this kind of money launderers tool called bitcoin we want the blockchain part of it but then once you look into it you realize well, actually well, how does the settlement occur and who's 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 the who's the guarantor of settlement and you know basically you fall into you go in one of one of two directions you go back towards the central bank model or or you go towards the permissionless model probabilistic model and i think that's a now the sock gen transaction i think you john mentioned i think is if i i may be wrong with this but i think they did it on on a using ethereum based tokens so they are they've, they've been moving towards the use of um these permissionless public blockchains and i think that's been a, an interesting trend over the last two or three years that financial institutions have recognized that you know, this is not going away and they need to have a foot in that camp as well so they've been uh you know there's been a lot of uh of, um, I suppose, uh, convergence of, of those two worlds with, with people now experimenting with, um, you know, the, 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 the non-national um, uh, networks, the, the, you know, the Bitcoin and the Ethereum uh, networks. I mean, John, what, what, do you, what are your thoughts on, on these? Because we see them pop up, you know, every two, three, four months you see in a transaction, there's a transaction between uh, Deca and uh, Metzler Bank recently as well. So, so they're starting to pop up a little bit more frequently. Do you see these as being kind of uh, uh, game changer movements, or is it just to give confidence to the firms themselves and the wider market that I, that this I is coming and you better get ready? I, I think it's a whimper that leads to a bang, because you have. I mean, the proof of con these are all proof of concept ideas, which is why, as you say, Roy, you you read about a one off transaction here and there. Whoops. But but there's also I mean there is more of a, a heavyweight approach to this because I you know I, both uh, Broadridge has a as a DLT repo uh, platform which is being used currently although it looks like it's used a lot about a lot of it seems to be internal movements of securities but nevertheless there is a proof of concept there that's, that's alive and well and kicking so I think over time. All of the questions that most most individuals or institutions will ask will get solved. I mean, I I have real issues with what if someone pulls the plug out of the wall? I know that sounds <laughs> crude, but I, I'm worried about uh, about absolute security of these assets. But I do think we're going to see the adoption of the technology trickle in where it becomes more more of a sort of 50 50 type of you can do it over this or you could or you could do it in the, in the traditional way and I, I think it will take years for it to become the dominant feature a bit like yeah, Omicron. Just, just a quick thing john like you know the whole thing about one of the arguments always in the gold versus bitcoin debate is you know if i take if i take some physical gold and i bury it in my garden and the power goes out i've still got the gold right so um, so yeah, so I, I started asking John about the uh, about the the top end of things, the central bank view on things. But Paul, you touched on um, uh, you know, retail investors and all of this because this is still largely a retail investor, although institutions are, are are obviously getting more engaged in it. And one of the interesting things I heard from a a, a seventeen year old was he was saying, "Well, look, it's it's just this is our opportunity." You know, my parents had housing. And then the next thing was the stock market to, to make you rich. And now all of that's kind of tapped out and, and sort of cryptocurrencies are, are my generation's opportunity to have that, uh, that life-changing wealth uh, accumulation opportunity. Any, any views on that? Yeah, I think these people should, I mean, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't want to um, dismiss that view because clearly the, the younger generation has, uh, has had it very tough, and it's not not fair the way things have uh, you know the, say the housing market has worked, or the fact that most of the the the, the wealth in securities markets is owned by older generations. But but I think you know I think that's a very dangerous uh, way of looking at things because people 
are really exposing themselves to a variety of um, you know pyramid schemes uh, you know plus the fact that if you look at the leading cryptocurrencies bitcoin for example the the concentration of ownership in bitcoin is actually worse than in the traditional financial system so if you have um you know measures of inequality let's say in the us or the uk which have gone up a lot over the last 30 years um uh, you know i don't think cryptocurrency is any better it's arguably much worse because of the the proportion of the coins that are controlled by a few uh, large whales so you know i would i would really uh, caution younger people you know to avoid jumping from the from the frying pan into the fire by thinking that this is a um you know a, a way of getting rich you know outside the, the traditional framework you know you might it might be easily as easily be a way of you know losing what you're you know the, the limited resources you already have and and we've seen so many cases of that this year with with tokens appearing and then and, and then disappearing very quickly there are so many scams and uh ponzi schemes because it's unregulated you can do whatever you like and if you're clever in setting up a token you can you can do that and, and you know run it for a few months or weeks and disappear Paul, I used to um, I used to say to myself that if Bitcoin or other currencies went to zero tomorrow, it wouldn't fundamentally change the economics of, of the yeah. globe. Is that still true? Because it because the value that is now in, in store, look at Bitcoin, even though yeah. it's, it's dipped, that might actually shift something. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting question. I uh... I mean, crypto markets, they got up to about two and a half trillion in value that maybe down to about two now or just under. Um, uh, I mean, in, the central bankers and the government's view has been that this is still not big enough to worry us. If you know Bitcoin did collapse to zero, it wouldn't be such a big deal. Uh, I'm not so sure that that's true anymore. I think that there are there are conduits from cryptocurrency to the traditional system that are not very well understood. And stable coins are probably the best example. So these these tokens representing units of traditional currency, usually the dollar, uh, that are backed by, you know, who knows what, um, and are very, very widely used within, they, they, they perform a critical role within the crypto markets so, so that, for example, 70 or 75% of Bitcoin transactions are referenced Tether, which is the leading dollar, uh, crypto, your, your leading dollar stable coin, rather than, dollar fiat itself in a bank account uh, so it's kind of uh the, the, this market has in parallel developed its own version of the, the fiat currencies but at the same time th these stable coins are now being very widely used as collateral across uh, cryptocurrency lending platforms they're, they're being used by hedge funds in arbitrage trades you know we saw early this year with the uh, archegos uh, i'm not sure if i pronounced that correctly but the the, the archegos hedge fund collapse that you know, even the most sophisticated banks in the world couldn't work out that uh, the same collateral was being pledged by the, the hedge fund to six or seven different firms. I mean, how you know, how much worse is it going to be in cryptocurrency where people don't know what's 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 backing some of these uh, tokens? So I'm 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 a bit concerned. And there was a really good uh, presentation by um, uh, an American researcher called Alexis Goldstein. She used to work as a technologist at Goldman Sachs and at uh, at Deutsche Bank, and she's highlighted this potential link, you know, or hedge the hedge fund involvement of cryptocurrency as a way, as a kind of transmission mechanism by which a problem in crypto could could transmit itself to the traditional market. So I I, I think that's that's something that's worth keeping an eye on, and I, I've sensed in recent comments from the Bank of England that they're they're beginning to think the same way and are, are, are also worried about it. Okay. Um... Thanks, Todd. I, th I think that is that's definitely an issue. We we have a few comments from the audience, which I just want to share. So, first of all, Guillermo, who uh, said thank you for the uh, the securities lending videos that we put up on YouTube, uh, helping prepare for an internship. Appreciate that. Uh, that that that's great news. That's why we do it. We're trying to bring more information, and understanding on a range of topics to things like this. Um, I know a number of people that have done the same thing. So, thanks very much. For those of you that don't know about the fundamentals uh, series we do it every uh, every saturday at 1 p.m well just about every saturday 28 out of the last 30. so i think that kind of counts um you can uh, check us out on youtube that's that's where it is uh we talk about all kinds of interesting things so so thanks garam appreciate uh, appreciate you taking the time to comment amel has got a couple of questions um and it one of them is about sort of uh, hacking 
Uh, and just before this program went live, uh, I saw a post on LinkedIn today talking about a hack. Now, I don't I didn't have a chance to actually look into it. So I don't know whether whether you guys have any uh, information on that. So, Paul. Well, there's been this like a bit of hack a day every every uh, you know the recent weeks uh, in the decentralized finance market because uh, you know there's a there's a you know there's a problem of insider knowledge in in many of these protocols. People close to them can insert malicious code and steal people's tokens. But I mean, in terms of hacking, basically everything. Let, let's let's maybe distinguish between the protocol of the cryptocurrency itself and and and, and the way you. You, know, you actually access the cryptocurrency. So, uh, as a technology, it's very difficult to 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 hack or to forge Bitcoin. You'd have, you'd need an enormous amount of computing power to alter the record. But uh, it, you know, if you're in terms of how you hold the cryptocurrency, whether you have it in a in a in a, in a wallet with, uh, with with you know safe storage, or whether whether the way you hold it can be easily um, attacked by an outsider, that's a very difficult and very you know, it's a it's a it's a big issue, and I, I I've seen a number of um, recent um, complaints by people on um, one of the leading U.S. cryptocurrency exchanges that they've you know they've had outsiders accessing their account and draining it. And you know, when I I, I first got involved in cryptocurrency uh, a few years ago, you know, I, I was told you know you need to buy you know a hardware wallet like a a, a ledger or a, a trezor, uh, the two leading brands. To hold your cryptocurrency and i think that's probably still pretty good advice uh, because you're not storing your private key online uh, it's it's in a little hardware device that's itself protected via various pins and, and uh, forms of uh, security but you know i went to a bitcoin conference a few months later and they one of the one of the people speaking was a was a nuclear physicist who showed that it was actually quite simple to you, know, to, you chop off the top of one of these hardware wallets you use a you use a laser to to, to un, unveil the circuit board, and you can reconstruct the pin from that. So basically, everything is everything is hackable at, uh, to to some extent. And and I suppose that parallels your comment, Roy, about having gold and and and, and you know burying it in the garden. Well, you know you can do that, but as we see from the, the hordes we we discover around the world, you know, people who did that in the past didn't always get to to go back and retrieve it. So uh, so uh, you know this is a similar thing. So Paul, as if I was a, as a retail investor, if I were to buy Bitcoin or another coin. Yeah, and I don't want to. I don't want to warehouse it myself. Where? What are the options where I could give it to a third party that I can trust? And and, and what? Are, and can they be hacked? And therefore, I'm not actually achieving. I, think, uh, I, I, I still think the, the the advice I always heard when I was starting to read and write about this area was, you know, if if you don't have possession of the private keys, they're not your bitcoins. So. If you buy if you buy bitcoins on an on exchange and get, send your money to the exchange and, and they're telling you, you know, they hold a bitcoin on your behalf, then it's not really yours. You should take it off the exchange, put it in your uh, personal wallet, and, and keep it there because then you have the flexibility to do with it what, what you want. You can move it to another exchange. You can send it directly to a third party. So even though there's a bit of uh, you know you have to be careful when we're doing this make sure you buy it from the right place the hardware wallets don't you know, don't get it on ebay from a from a, a reseller um because there were cases where people um you know were, were reselling hardware wallets and in fact were, were hacking were using the interaction to to steal people's money so um, is, i think i think that i think that's still the best advice but there, there could be an, a whole industry that could grow up offering custodial services to retail investors in this regard right Yes, and I mean there there already really is, and 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 to be honest, I mean I, I, even though I've said not your keys, not your coins, the reality is that 99 percent of retail investors experimenting with cryptocurrency will not pay attention to that. They will they will use whatever they use to whether it's Robinhood or Revolut or Coinbase. They'll use some of these intermediaries to, and they won't uh, you know they won't try and move the cryptocurrency off because you you know it's it's. Having done it myself, it's you know it's frankly nerve-wracking. You know you have to look where you're sending the, the the coins to. If you get one letter or digit wrong in in the in the address, your cryptocurrency could be lost forever. It's a serious thing. So I mean, people will and they are already paying. There are some very sophisticated intermediaries you know, doing that. And and they, and I think these, if you're involved in cryptocurrency, probably you know, being being an exchange or a custodian of some kind is probably the best business to be in. Uh, you're you know, you're more you're more immune from the 
and the price movements. I just have a quick question on what you guys have just been talking about. One of the things that I think is so ironic, seeing all of these uh, banks and brokers and asset managers getting involved with, with digital assets, is that the whole idea of decentralized finance is to actually get, get rid of all the intermediaries and have it all be sort of direct point to point and you know just bilateral type things and not needing that infrastructure yet. What seems to be being created is just a parallel set of infrastructure, just with the different assets. Am I wrong? No, you're, it's absolutely that's absolutely right. I mean, and, and decentralized finance is just a—it's a great marketing term, but it doesn't—it uh, doesn't match the reality. If you look at when something goes wrong in one of these protocols, there's a group of group of uh, software developers or insiders, we can call them, who who can change the rules as necessary. So, in you know, in, in an extreme case. It's not decentralized at all. There are people who step in and, and change things. Paul, is there a parallel to be drawn to the payments industry where, I mean, I read endlessly on FinExtra where there's a new payment system every day, uh, which is going to revolutionize uh, either a country or, or, or make it cheaper. And, and I think there's a lot of value in, in rural areas and parts of the world where this could be of, of true value. And yet at some point it all has to go back to an account somewhere. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when I use PayPal, it's still my money that's being debited from my bank account, which yeah. PayPal has to have links to. So they can't decouple from the the system itself totally, correct yeah. or not? Yes, and the whole idea behind the, the fintech revolution was that these new payment firms, these new money service businesses or e-money institutions, they were not supposed to be lending money themselves. So they had to, they were just performing the technology part of the transaction, helping with the, the payment itself. But they were not lending anyone any money, so that that was still the there was still there had to be a bank at the end of the of the chain somewhere that was uh, you know, settling things and, if necessary, extending credit. Right. So thank, thanks, thanks, guys. There's, there's still a couple of things I'd like to cover off. Um, the, Paul, one of the things that you talked about, uh, you, you you mentioned stable coins, but I'm wondering yeah. if you can like pause and again explain for those of us that are that are kind of newer to this what is the difference kind of between stable coins and say bitcoin um and then i, th I think john it, it's an area of interest for john as well so so stable coin is just a it's a it's a it's a token that you can transmit from a digital wallet to another digital wallet uh, in the same way as you can transmit a bitcoin uh, but the, the stable coin has a sp the explicit objective of, of of being stable by reference to a a fiat currency such as the dollar or the euro or the pound or the yen so uh you know the leading the the most popular stable coin in terms of uh the, the most dollar popular dollar stable coin is called tether it was set up um specifically by participants in the crypto business as a way of uh you know moving their funds from one when they people were moving their funds from one place to another let's say out of bitcoin or into bitcoin uh, from somewhere else they wanted to have a somewhere they could park funds in the interim and they couldn't access, most of them couldn't access the banking system because they, um, you know, the banks in those days were not very happy about offering accounts to cryptocurrency exchanges or anybody involved in that, uh, in that area of the market. So stable coins were really kind of an unintended consequence of, um, of the crypto markets development. And they've grown enormously because people realize that you can, I can, you know, if I have some tether on my, mobile phone, I can transfer it to you. It settles pretty much instantaneously. Uh, and, and it's treated by many people as, as money, as dollars. So the, the, um, these tokens have, have um, achieved pretty wide acceptance in different parts of the world. There are stories of Chinese traders traveling to Russia to sell their goods at a market and being paid in tether, then going back to China and exchanging their tether for local goods and services. I read, read a story yesterday that Tether's being used widely in Myanmar as a, by the opposition group as a way of spreading funds. So, you know, th these things have, um, have achieved quite, you know, rapidly achieved quite wide acceptance. And I was looking at the, the asset figures for Tether. It's gone up from $4 billion in April last year, just after the coronavirus pandemic uh, uh, exploded. And it's now $77 billion. So it's up nearly 20-fold in assets in, in a year and a bit. Uh, but, uh, and it's a big but, the, you know the the asset backing of some of these coins is questionable at best now the if you have a spare half hour you might want to read through the uh, 
uh, New York Attorney General settlement with Tether, which came out last year, and they provided conclusive evidence that basically the the, the operators of, of Tether had been, you know, hadn't kept it fully back. There'd been periods when it, they they'd been saying it was backed by dollars held in bank accounts, and, and Tether wasn't. So there was the money wasn't there. That they they shifted money in to meet a, a date on a particular date when they were being checked by an auditor and took it out the very next day and, and used it for some other purpose. So you know, for people who from the traditional financial markets, maybe if you if you're managing a money market fund or client assets, these are kind of big big no nos, and they they just got away with it because they people were you know, they first of all it's not that easy to redeem tether, so there's a there's a break on people exiting, and 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 they've been they benefited from the general explosion of interest in, in crypto. So, but this is a, a still a in Tether's case, it's still a, a time bomb. I mean, there are, there's some great journalism now about Tether. There's a, there was a fantastic Bloomberg article a couple of months ago where the journalists went around the world trying to track down the reserves, and they found that Tether had been lending money in the Chinese commercial paper market. And no one knows what the, you know, who the issuers are. Well, as we know, you know, Chinese, uh, Chinese corporate debt is not the best place to be in at the moment. Um, uh, they, he, he went to the Bahamas to track down the Tether's supposed banker, and you know, he was a bit uh, cagey about what was actually there so there's a you know, it's a great story from a journalist perspective but it's also it, you know you wouldn't uh, you if you it, it, i mean it, the evidence is that people treat tether like a like a hot potato they they, they get it they you know, they pass it on very quickly so if your holding period is only an hour uh, probably you're you're not too worried that it's going to collapse within the hour that you hold it but it, uh, you know it's not a stable setup um, so, well when, when yeah. i when i read about this in i think may that only 2.7 percent of tether was backed by actual dollars yeah um it triggered alarm bells for me and then you dig deeper and you find out that they are one of the largest commercial paper buyers in the market um because it's all commercial paper and of course we know the commercial paper has can have its own issues so yeah. the de definition of being backed by because they they would claim that they were backed by dollars or 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 close to dollar assets but commercial paper isn't um, and it depends what rating it is and depends how liquid yeah. it is. So it's better that it's something it's backed by something. I agree. But I think I, I think Tether has had a relaxed attitude with the truth over this. I mean, and, that's putting it that's putting it, it. That, that's putting it mildly. I mean, they, they took money out of Tether to, to prop to prop up the exchange that was owned by the same people, Bitfinex, because they had lost. Right. I mean, lost in inverted commas, 800 billion dollars through some dodgy dealings with a, a, a money processor in the in the Caribbean who who also was employed by the Colombian mafia I mean these are these are some very dodgy people uh that we're talking about and you know you don't have to look very far on the internet to see you know to, to, to find to read some stories about some of the people involved so I mean the, as as with most of these things you you know do your own research and and, and buy beware but it's some of the risks are are extreme and I, I must you know on that point I must give a there's a great book written by uh, David Gerard, who's a very outspoken. I mean, he hates cryptocurrency. He's a very big skeptic, but he's he's also written a brilliant book uh, called "The Attack of the Fifty Foot Blockchain," which came out a couple of years yeah. ago. And uh, and it just it's worth a read because it's not it's it just he David has been around since the beginning. He knows the people involved, and he just, it's just a actually a fantastic uh, series of anecdotes about some of the crazy things that people got up to in crypto and. Uh, and I still, you know, even though we've seen that this, this space has now, uh, you know, it's attracted all the investment banks and the hedge funds. And I saw this week that ISDA has, you know, been introduced some new rules for crypto assets. It's, it's you've got financial indices based on crypto, so it's it's not you know, not kind of a conventional asset class, but the it, it's really, uh, you know, it's quite quite an interesting uh, story to see the the origins of some of these uh, some of these. Some of these protocols. Having said all that, I mean, it's uh, we will know that some of the, you know, the 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 wealthy, you know, oligarchs in the U.S. in the 1920s and elsewhere, they you know they they built their fortunes in in very uh, you know unsavory ways at some at some points, and, and they got to keep it all. So uh, so who's to say that this won't that these won't be the, the 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 market infrastructure of the future? Who knows? Yeah, I mean, I think I think for me these the intermediaries that are getting into the business are getting into the business because their customers want to be there and they yeah. see it as a, as a spread business just like anything else right it's just yeah. their opportunity to make extra money why wouldn't they is it not this is not you know we haven't got a bunch of banks going in there doing you know leveraged prop trading on it right that that, yeah. that 
that isn't systemically risky from that perspective. So why not take money if people want to trade it? And this looks like sure. a tradable instrument rather than an investment to me. Yeah, I mean, and the, and the margins, as you say, Roy, are, you know, are incredible. I, mean, I looked at some of the, there are some, we've probably all read that in the US, there's been a struggle to get a Bitcoin ETF off the ground because the regular way, regulator won't allow it. But there are some other ones around the world. And I was looking at um, some of the ETPs, I should use that term because they're not funds, but ETPs run by a, a Swiss firm called 21 Shares. And I was They've, they've attracted a lot of money and, uh, you know, they just basically what they do, they buy a cryptocurrency token, wrap it in the note structure, whatever it is, call it an ETP, and then they're charging two and a half percent a year. Now, I, I used to write about ETFs when, you know, we used to get worked up if uh, iShares was charging 12 basis points and Vanguard was charging 11 or 12 or 13 or whatever. And, and here you've got an ETP charging two and a half. I mean, it's, it's wacky great fees and people are making a fortune. In fact, our last our last live stream was with someone who was who was at twenty one shares at the okay. time. No, okay. no longer, no longer, uh, no longer there. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, that's it. You know, the 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 Bitcoin ETF. You know, I I think I think it's interesting because they said no to that, and yet you can have triple inverse <laughs> ETFs, which any retail punter can buy. So, so this seems to me to be a, a lack of, of consistency and, and because I know people that personally trade it without really actually understanding what that means, just because they know it's volatile enough that they can make money trading it. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, this has been the year of GameStop and Tesla and all these crazy, you know, bubbles in individual yeah. stocks as well. So p people have, people have, you know, there's very risky behavior going on across all the markets. It's, it's from crypto to shares and elsewhere definitely a different well this is another question from the audience has been with us for a while uh and it's one that gets asked quite a lot can cryptocurrency uh be used as a hedge against inflation which is which is just a classic question that's been asked about a thousand times uh this year alone um what do you think paul well this is the you know bitcoin <clears throat> as a store of value argument isn't it um well let's talk about bitcoin rather than cryptocurrency in general because they're, they're, they're all they all operate differently um if you buy dogecoin it's not a hedge against inflation because they can they can issue as much as they want and strangely people still you know pump the price up but anyway that's a separate uh, topic so bitcoin um 21 million coins you know limits an issue probably three or four million of those have been lost already they're out of circulation um so it is a it is a deflationary asset um but it's also a very volatile one so uh i personally would say uh it's not a hedge against inflation it's just a it's a very volatile asset that if you you, know, if you hold it at the right time you might be lucky and, and beat inflation by a lot but you might also lose 50 percent of your purchasing power in a day so that's uh that doesn't seem to me like a good uh inflation hedge uh, so you're probably better off in the traditional inflation hedges none of which are very cheap at the moment but but um uh, but that that's that's my opinion yeah i mean if anything it looks like bitcoin has a relationship to the fang stocks they yeah they look like they're tracking each other i think there's been a decoupling in in the last year but certainly from 14 onwards it, they they're pretty much running in parallel yeah so maybe the same people that bought you know they were very keen on tesla were very, very keen on bitcoin yeah but obviously, then you're not you're going in the same direction, so not a hedge. But um, I tend to agree with you, Paul. It, it out of interest, you mentioned that the 21 million limit. Do you know how much is not yet mined, or is there no stats on that? I think uh, I think there's about two and a half million coins left to be mined out of the 21. But that's not happening in China. Uh, so we're told. Yeah, I mean, how, how, who knows if they. I don't know. I don't really under. I mean, it, it does sound as if they, the Chinese really did uh, stop Bitcoin mining because there were these stories of, you know, truckloads of um, mining equipment arriving in Kazakhstan or Russia or whatever and uh, crossing the border. So, uh, and uh, or, the, or or being transported to the U.S. So they, they apparently did get rid of most of it. I suppose on that point, then, um, do you think regulation will be the death of cryptocurrencies, or Will it, will it always escape regulation? I mean, I'm thinking particularly or, in the US. Or, John, or will it be the savior of it? So add add that in. So will it be the death or will it be the savior or will it be avoided? If of I can of just course, add yeah, it. because it could it could legitimize it even further, right? I I actually think the regulators are going about this in the right way. I think they, they are focusing on the intermediaries like exchanges, making sure that people 
you know, identify themselves when, as far as possible, when when using the, the intermediaries, because we have to we have to recognize that you can't really, if it comes taking Bitcoin again as an example, you can't really shut it down. How do you shut it down? It's right. you have to turn off the internet. So uh, so it's going to be there, and it's going to it's going to be there for a, for a long time. Um, there are some potential problems when the block subsidy runs out, which will be sometime, you know long after we're all gone, uh, sometime in the middle of next century, but the, you know, the, the block subsidy declines by half every four years, but then at some point in the 22nd century, it will run out completely and the and Bitcoin miners will have to be paid uh, only from transaction fees. Now that that uh, will actually cause some, um, it, it, it disturbs the equilibrium of the system because it can, it, it can, it, it can encourage uh, destabilizing behavior by the by the miners and there's some interesting papers on that written uh, by I think economists at the, the BIS uh, but that's that's quite a long way into the future I think for the, for the for the you know the next decade or two I don't think Bitcoin is is going away I don't think the other cryptos are, I mean some of the some of the other projects will probably dwindle into in, insignificance even if they don't disappear because it doesn't cost that much to keep them going um, and uh you know what happens from i think we probably will move from a period of these tokens being used for extreme speculation to maybe another use case i i, I interviewed someone called uh paul gordon on the new money review podcast a few months ago and he he said that he thinks that you know, this this latest bull market for, for crypto will be the last one in terms of you know huge price uh, speculation and he thinks that the, the cryptocurrency will actually or could form the basis of a of a global identity system because you you know you, you, people might might want to have an alternative to the national digital ID schemes that are being set up. So that's an interesting. Uh, I thought that was an interesting forecast. But these are these are probably trends that are going to play out over over decades. Yeah, and certainly you know that's in you know one of the conspiracy theories is that the reason that central banks want their own digital currencies to be pervasive is because it's easier to track what everyone does, right? And then if you look at the Chinese model, sort of, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, docking people that have bad, you know, what's judged to be bad public behavior or or giving them benefits if if they actually do good things as perceived by the state. So um, I think that's coming. I think that's coming to all of us, Roy. I think the Chinese are just ahead of what everybody else is, is doing. I think we're all going to see that. I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> so, There's always uh, gold. There's always gold. There's always gold. And there will always be gold. Um, look, I think we, we we haven't covered half of the topics that, that uh, we talked about covering. So, uh, you know, Paul, you 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 have to come back. Uh, so you have to give me access to your diary so I can just like book book another time in. OK, sounds um, good. But I'm wondering if there's sort of any if, if you have any sort of if you step back and you look at the trends and you look at the issues and you look at the challenges, wondering if there's any kind of one message you want to leave with people yes i i i, I um something that uh, david birch whose book i mentioned earlier said uh, has, has struck me and, and that is that what's going on in money is going to lead to big political changes so we should not see those things in 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 isolation you, know, you shouldn't just look at money as just changes in money it's because money is linked to digital identity in that debate you just mentioned, Roy, about privacy and who gets to see whose internet activity. These things are all being, these things are all happening together. So the, the, the debate about Facebook's involvement in Brexit and, and, and the US election when Trump was elected and the, the manipulation of users data, this cannot be seen separately from what's going on in money because it's the same, it's the same thing. So, you know, I, I, my, my, argument would be that we should try and take even though it's difficult we should try and take a as big picture of view of what's going on as possible we should link things from different spheres not just money but looking across technology to to governance uh, anthropology all these things it's it's a it's a difficult topic but i think we have to always think about what's going on in a broader context Right. Thanks, uh, John. Anything you want to add from your own perspective? No, I, I think I think what Paul just said was was actually very interesting. I mean, I look at this as I look at cryptocurrencies in general in a compute pu in a purely neutral fashion, in that it's happening around me. I observe it. I try and understand 
what might be causing some of its volatility, but I come to no conclusions about that, apart from that it Bitcoin looks like it's a it looks like it's a massive Ponzi scheme to some extent. And yet I recognize that it has a store of value because it has because it's worth forty six thousand dollars. I, I'm looking for ways that it will be applicable in a wider scale, and I haven't come up with them. But to Paul's point, um, you know, give it 10 years. I mean, in 10 or 15 years, we will actually be using blockchain technology for a lot more things than we are today. And these, and either, whether it's stable coin, a central bank digital currency, or, or just a cryptocurrency, well, these will be part of the fabric of what we do. So I, 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 I see that coming, um, but I just won't be that interested at that time. Okay, well, look, thanks for that. My own my own closing comments are: I'm someone that's actually been paid by clients in Bitcoin and cashed them in. So they're ne <laughs> so I cash them in for one twelfth of their current value. So whatever I've said that you think is a good idea, trade. probably Do the wrong. opposite. That's contrarian, <laughs> right? That's my recommendation to you. So listen, uh, thanks very much to everyone in the audience for some great questions and comments. Appreciate that, and always. Uh, Always thankful when you uh, when you join us. Join us again next Wednesday. Um, particularly, Paul, I thought that was really fascinating. I really appreciate that. And you're definitely going to be coming back on, uh, whether you like it or not. And, and you're uh, coming on the new Money Review podcast as well. To talk about I, your talk about securities lending. I, I, I love your that's, stories. That's 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 the trade we'll make. That's the trade of the day, folks. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm very happy to do that. And thank you for the invitation. Uh, and John, uh, you know. Fascinating observations as always. Um, you are you are my digital guy in the in the firm. So uh, so thanks for that. Okay, that's it, everyone. Thanks again. Thanks very Let's much. See, see you Thank next you. Tuesday or next Wednesday at ten o'clock uh, for the quiz. Bring your reindeer hat. Have a good one. Okay. Bye. Bye bye.